Hi, and thank you for tuning into this video. This is the picture I drew in my last video in which I told the story of how a print of one of my paintings sold to the National Gallery of Canada. And I'm totally gonna brag about that even though I technically had nothing to do with it and it was only because I was in the right place at the right time that I kind of fluked out and wound up with a piece in the permanent collection of Canada's most prestigious gallery. So if you haven't seen that video, check it out. It's the last upload on my channel. I've been having so much fun with these story time drawing videos and I'm really grateful to those of you who commented on the last one and to the people who have let me know uh, that you're enjoying this little series too. And I've decided to make these on a regular basis. So at least once a week, you can expect a new drawing and story time video. Last night while I was planning this, I made a post on Facebook asking my friends and my Facebook followers to vote on their top pick for today's video. And I gave three topic suggestions. Uh, the first suggestion that I was thinking of, you know, kind of opening up about, was a time when the cult leader who calls himself Nityananda uh, gave me the instruction to basically destroy a, a spiritual YouTuber called Teal Swan. And I mean, if you're new to my channel, you might not even know about that video, but it was quite the drama back in, boy, I think it was 2017, maybe 2016 or 2017. Uh, anyhow, that, that was voted second most popular topic or most requested topic. Uh, the, other, the other suggestion I came up with was ghost stories. And you already know this because of the title of the video, but that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, my third topic suggestion was going vegan in 1999. Uh, yeah, in 1999, in the summer between grade 9 and grade 10, I made the transition from vegetarian to vegan. Best decision I've ever made. Um, and quite ahead of its time because there were quite a few funny instances that I experienced. Um, that was that was kind of the least popular of my topic suggestions, but a few people still voted for that one, so I will make that, you know, a couple of videos from now. So first and foremost, let's get into these ghost stories. I want to, you know, say right off the bat, if you're into ghost stories and if you like that feeling of being scared, like if you kind of enjoy that anxious, tense feeling where you don't know what's about to happen and, and you enjoy being kind of freaked out and not knowing why something is the way it is, you're going to like this video. And well, I don't mean you're going to hit the like button. I hope you're going to hit the like button, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy these stories. And you might want to kind of set the mood, you know, maybe turn off the lights if it's nighttime when you're seeing this. Pour yourself a, a mug of herbal tea or something, like settle in, get cozy. Because it's going to be a long video. I've got quite a few interesting ghost stories. And the first took place in my grandparents' basement when I was about five years old. And, you know, this was the first time I ever in my entire life experienced what some people would call a ghost encounter. Um, probably a lot of other people would, would refer to this more as sleep paralysis or, you know, a nightmare. Um, but to this day, I'm convinced it was not just a nightmare and it, it was something far, far worse than sleep paralysis. So what happened was whenever my mom went out of town for a teacher's convention or a teacher's conference, uh, I would sleep at my grandparents' house. And, you know, for whatever reason, their guest bedrooms were set up in their basement. And because I was so young, my granddad would actually make a little bed for himself on the couch outside of the guest bedroom. 
in kind of what was their TV room. And, you know, he would sleep there so that if I got scared in the night, which, I mean, I never did at my, at my house, at my mom's house, but uh, I can see now why he kind of set himself up down there to, to be ready to deal with any, any trauma that I might encounter in the night, any terror. Uh, but anyhow, I, I remember really vividly this one night when I was sleeping in one of the two downstairs bedrooms in my grandparents' house. Um, I, I wasn't yet asleep, so it's not like I woke up in the middle of the night and something was happening. It's like I, I was still falling asleep. It was still, um, you know, my granddad was watching Hockey Night in Canada, so I could still hear the hockey game on the TV in the next room. I, my door was closed, but it was kind of left just a crack open, so I could even still see the light coming in through that crack, and, you know, I knew my granddad was right there. But somehow, something that's so funny, there's, there's like weird sounds coming from my apartment right now that don't usually happen. I don't think that's ghosts, but it's kind of an interesting timing. Um, somehow, something or someone was standing in the doorway of my bedroom. And what was really terrifying for me was that the only people home in that house were my granddad, who was in the next room sitting in his chair watching TV, and my grandmom, who was upstairs. And yet I could see this, this really dark, shadowy figure of a man standing in the doorway of my bedroom, and he was on the inside of that doorway. So remember, like, the door was a crack open. Um, so it was kind of like just in this dusky kind of light, I could see this shadowy figure of a man standing there. And just kind of as I, I was about to scream, like, Granddad, like, come help me, uh, that shadowy figure rushed forward and grabbed me by the ankles and started pulling me off the bed. Um, from the from like the feet of the bed pulling me off the bed and I I couldn't make any noise like I tried to scream but no sound would come out and that's why I'm thinking a lot of a lot of um, you know skeptical people would refer to this experience as sleep paralysis but like I said I, I hadn't even fallen asleep yet so I don't know I don't really understand psychology or uh, brain chemistry that well, but it, it didn't feel like I was asleep and that I was having sleep paralysis, especially because I could still move my arms and legs. So I was trying to kick at this, this shadowy entity. Uh, I, I wasn't able to scream, but I was trying to kick at it. And like the, the room had these old 1970s wooden paneled walls that had been painted white. And I, I can still remember to this day how it felt trying to like grab, grab with my fingernails and like hold on to these wood panels to brace myself so that I couldn't be pulled out of the bed. Um, and eventually, like, I don't know how long this little incident lasted, but after maybe, you know, a minute of struggle, where I'm, I'm kicking and clawing at the walls, trying to avoid getting yanked out of bed by this shadowy, scary figure, it just stopped. It stopped. Like, the, the figure disappeared, my, my ankles, my feet were free to move on their own again. Um, and I just heard, you know, my granddad was still in the next room watching this hockey game. So I called for him and said, Granddad! And, and of course he rushed to my room and said, what is it, dear, are you okay? And I said, Granddad, who was that? Who was that man? Like, what, what, what just happened? Like, I was freaking out, as any little kid would. Uh, or I, not even little kid, as any, even to this day, if something like that happened, it would freak me the F out. And so I was like, Granddad, who was that? Like, somebody just came into my room and tried to pull me out of bed, and it was terrifying. Um, I probably didn't articulate it that succinctly because I was like five, like I said. 
Um, and, and he just sat with me. He sat on, there were two beds in that bedroom. So he just sat himself down on the other bed and said, don't worry, dear, there's nobody else down here. It's just you and me, grandmom's upstairs. Um, you probably just had a dream. And I, and I said, but I wasn't asleep yet. And he said, well, then you have a very vivid imagination, um, which I, I didn't like, who would imagine something like that and why? But anyhow, he, he sat with me until I fell asleep. And that was the only incident that took place that particular night. And thank God the next day, uh, my mom was home from her conference and so I got to sleep in my own bed, in my own house once again. Um, what's, what's really interesting about this is that in my entire childhood, the only kind of scary paranormal experiences that took place were in my grandparents' basement. And it's not like that's the only place I ever slept. I would go, you know, to friends' houses for sleepovers. Um, I would regularly stay over at my, my auntie's house and, you know, I, I, I had other aunts and uncles who I would stay with. Like we trapped, my mom and I did a lot of road trips, so we'd stay in motel rooms and stuff. Um, but the only place where I had these terrifying experiences was my grandparents' basement. So it's not like, you know, if, if you want to hear that story and think, uh, I must have been that kind of kid who had a lot of night terrors. I didn't. I, I, in fact, I only had one nightmare in my entire childhood. One. It, and you know, most of my dreams were just good, happy, pleasant dreams. I used to have dreams about it being Christmas morning and opening presents. And I'd have dreams about going to Disneyland and riding roller coasters and most of my dreams were flying dreams, um, you know, where you're flying over the city and you're like, whoa, this is so cool. I didn't even know I could fly. And then you wake up and you're like, oh yeah, duh, I can't. It's a dream. Um, but yeah, no, it's not like I had this, this terrifying nightly occurrence as a kid. I just had this stuff happen at my grandparents' house. And, you know, a, a few months later, the next time my mom went out of town and I had to sleep over at my grandparents' house, I was genuinely scared to go to bed in that room. And I asked, you know, can I sleep on the couch upstairs instead? Like, um, I just didn't want to sleep down there. But my grandparents assured me nothing would happen. And as per usual, my granddad slept on the couch in the basement. Um, and, and in the night, I had another terrifying experience. And this time it happened after I had already fallen asleep. But again, something tried grabbing me in the night. Uh, not by the ankles, um, but it was like something sat on my chest. And I felt this like heavy, heavy presence. And it, it wasn't like, you know, a, a, it wasn't like a weird airy feeling. It's not like something floated onto my chest or a breeze passed by my chest. It was like something was trying to choke the air out of my lungs by pressing down hard on my lungs. It was frightening beyond description. And again, just like the time before I tried to scream, but no sound would come out. Um, I couldn't move because that thing was on top of me and I really thought I was going to die. Like the previous time, I just thought I'm going to get dragged out of bed and, and beaten or, you know, hurt in some way. But this next time, it, it really felt like this thing was trying to kill me. And I don't know, like I don't remember how that experience ended. I just know you know, thank goodness it did end. And, you know, I, I eventually fell asleep because when I woke up the next morning, I was still in that room, still in that bed, still in my grandparents' basement. I could hear my grandmom and granddad talking upstairs. So he had obviously woken up and gone upstairs. And I just bolted out of bed and ran to the bathroom to wash my face and brush my teeth and get dressed and then go upstairs. And, 
Like even in the light of the day, even in the morning light streaming in through the windows, I was still like straight up scared, like high key frightened. Um, and I told my grandparents about it and said, there's something scary in your basement. And they just thought I was being like an overdramatic kid. And you know, as I grew up, um, it, it struck me as very interesting that my younger cousin, um, I, I have a, a male cousin who's about six years younger than me. He was also terrified to go into my grandparents' basement. And you know, get the grown-ups would kind of laugh about it, like, oh yeah, he doesn't want to go downstairs by himself. Somebody's got to go with him. Um, my grandma had a pantry at the bottom of her stairs, and that's where she kept like pop and chips and treats for kit for the kids. And it's a big family. Like my mom is the oldest of seven siblings, so there were lots of aunties and uncles and cousins. And yeah, like I I didn't really ever talk with my little cousin and say like, hey, I've had some, some really frightening experiences in that basement. So don't worry, buddy. Like you're not the only one who doesn't want to go down there. Like it's a scary place. Um, I just kind of kept it to myself because I, I didn't want to scare this kid further. I would have been about 12 by the time he was like five or six. Um, and, and he was the kind of kid, like, I used to love this show in Canada called Are You Afraid of the Dark? Maybe maybe you had that show in the States, too, but there, there was the show Goosebumps and another show, Are You Afraid of the Dark? And they'd come on YTV, which was the kids' channel. And I, I loved those shows. And I loved, like, ghost stories of the campfire. Uh, but that little cousin of mine did not. He, he would, like... He would get, he would actually scream if somebody started to sing or, or like hum the Goosebumps tune. Um, or if my, if my aunt or uncle started whistling the theme song from the X-Files, like Like he would, he would leave the room screaming in terror because he was so scared of that. And it, that shows like whoever, whatever Hollywood guy, um, whatever Hollywood soundtrack writer, what, what do they call these people? Whenever, whichever composer made that theme song for X-Files, like deserves some, some recognition and some credit because this kid had never even watched the show X-Files. He was too young for it, but the theme song scared him. So, I mean, successful songwriting. They, they wrote a creepy little tune. Anyhow, I, I never told that cousin that I was also afraid of our grandparents' basement. And in fact, like, I was the oldest of all my cousins. So I never really spoke much with any of my little cousins, except for a, a couple of them who lived in Calgary. Two boys who were about, you know, eight to ten years younger than me. Um, I would, I would talk with them a bit because we would, I would sometimes babysit them when they were in town and, you know, we would sit and draw pictures like this. I, I showed them both how to do abstract drawings and to just not even think about it. Just put the pen on the paper and see what happens. And they loved it. So we would usually spend our time kind of an in amicable silence, like just drawing like this or we'd play catch outside in the backyard, but it's not like I was ever like, hey guys, have you ever, have you ever experienced like a, a terrifying ghostly encounter at grandma's house? Like it just never came up in conversation. Um, but a couple of years ago, I, I was chatting with one of these cousins who, who of course now he's a grown up man. Um, and it just came up in conversation that all of my little cousins, he, he himself and his brother and the other cousin who I had mentioned earlier was terrified of that basement, plus a, a few more even younger cousins who live here in Lethbridge, uh, every single one of them had had a ghost encounter in my, my grandparents' old basement. They've since sold that house. Um, 
But yeah, he was like, so by the way, Sarah, like, did, did you ever have like any ghost experiences in that house? Because we all have. And I was like, holy shit, like, yeah. And so I told him this story. And he told me about a time when he and his younger brother were, you know, just downstairs in that basement playing in the middle of the day. And my granddad had like a, a fairly large, extensive library of books. He, ha he had tons and tons of books. Um, bookshelves basically lined or, or bordered every wall in that basement in the main TV sitting room. So my cousin said that, that he and his little brother were playing and all of a sudden, one of those books, like far away, like at least a good 10 feet away from where everybody else was in that room, one of those books just came flying off the shelf. Uh, it didn't, it didn't, it's not like it fell. It's not like the house shook and a book that was kind of sitting ajar or on top of the shelf got jostled loose and fell like a book that was that was pushed far into the bookshelf flew off the shelf and like he and his little brother gasped and, and like jumped and he said my granddad didn't even like didn't even mute the television because he was watching tv he just said like oh don't worry boys that's just bob the ghost and they were like what like you've named the ghost? Like, how do you know the ghost's name? And I asked them, like, it, it's too bad I can't do any follow-up questions because my grandfather passed away a, a couple of years ago, which is, it, it was very sad. I loved my granddad. Um, but I asked him, like, did granddad name the ghost or did he know the ghost's name? Like, how come when I was a kid and I had that crazy, dark, shadowy figure try to yank me by my ankles out of the bed, like, the answer was that I was dreaming, but, but when you guys see a book fly off the shelf, it's Bob the Ghost, like, was that, was there a man named Bob who died in that house, or, or what? And, like, my granddad spent a lot of time in that basement, he he made and painted model airplanes in in the basement and his main big screen tv was set up down there and he had a writing desk and like i said all his books were down there so i mean it's not like he ever avoided that that space and my grandma spent a lot of time down there by herself too her sewing room was down there and she sews a lot like she's made very elaborate beautiful quilts and stuff so it's not like they avoided being down there um but yeah a and there are so many stories so many ghostly encounters um it finally came out that even my aunties and uncles who used to have their bedrooms down there uh, that even they had had ghost experiences and it's like dudes why did you make your kids sleep down there whenever you drop them off at your parents' house if you knew that the place was freaking haunted? Um, one of my favorite stories was that, that that same room that I had slept in where that thing had tried to pull me out of the bed by my ankles, back in the day, that room was shared by two of my aunties who are about a year apart. So they, they were little girls at the time when they shared that bedroom together and they kind of grew up in it. So little girls into teenagers. And there was one particular night when, and I, and I mean, they, they can correct me if I'm wrong on any of these details. Um, Cause really it's their story to tell. I'm just telling it for them. But my, the younger of my aunties was lying in bed sleeping and she thought that her older sister had just slapped her hard across the face. And so she started yelling at her, like, what the F? Like, why did you just slap me? And my other auntie was like lying in bed, sleeping, woke up to hearing her little sister yell, like, why did you just slap me? And she's like, I didn't slap you. And the auntie who got slapped could hear 
that her sister was still in bed and thus incapable of being the one who slapped her and their door was closed they would have heard it if somebody had come in like it it was she got ghost slapped um there's no other way to word it she she got slapped by that ghost probably that same asshole who tried dragging me out of the, the bed by my feet when i was a little kid so yeah like it's just whether you believe in ghosts or in paranormal activity or not, like there is something effed up about that house. Um, I think I think my my grandparents mentioned when they first sold it and moved that it was a Filipino family who bought it. So if if you know any Filipino families, or if you're a member of a Filipino family in Lethbridge, Alberta, and you bought a house like about five years ago and like crazy scary shit happens in that house's basement like dm me or something because because i'm curious to know if if the current family living there also has messed up frightening experiences and like i said it, it wasn't just me or those other two male cousins or or the other cousin who's a little older like Apparently, all of my cousins who have ever had to sleep in that room have had weird stuff happen to them. So yeah, my grandparents' basement. And I, in fact, my auntie, one of my aunties, maybe both of my aunties, had sent written accounts of other ghost stories from that same basement to a podcast they used to listen to called Ales from the Crypt that I wish I had listened to it when it was still a thing because I think the girls who did it stopped, but um, it was a, it sounded like a really neat sort of a podcast that was kind of like a ghost story version of Drunk History where they would, they would just drink beer and read ghost stories sent in by their listeners. So yeah, the, this this basement is already kind of infamous or notorious in the in in some kind of an online community of of paranormal interest um if it was still in the family like if if my grandparents still owned it or if if that house had sold to somebody i'm related to i would be super tempted to call in some paranormal research group to do some kind of experiments on it um in fact, when I was a teenager and kind of becoming friends with a guy, we weren't dating yet. It, it was like that pre-going out stage of friendship where you like somebody and you hang out with them all the time, but there's there's been no official ask out yet. During that stage of dating a guy, my grandparents went out of town once. They They were... They were world travelers. They've gone everywhere, like Egypt and Tunisia and England a bunch of times. And they went on a, a cruise to um, Antarctica, like Australia. They've, they've been everywhere, literally everywhere. They've, they've gone to each continent, everywhere but Japan. That was the only place left on, on their list when my granddad sadly passed. But I digress. Um, yeah, when I was maybe 16 or 17, my grandparents went out of town once and they left me their house key uh, to go in and water the plants and to play their piano. I love playing the piano and didn't have a piano of my own. So whenever I wanted to play, I'd, I'd walk to my grandparents' house. So I invited this guy to, to come over with me because we were hanging out after school and you know, I had to go there to water the plants anyway. So I invited him to come in with me and take in the mail. And I, I kind of told him about the basement and said, like, I'm scared to go down there. Like, I will not go down there. And he, he talked me into going downstairs with him so that he could check it out. And he said he could feel like a scary presence. Um, and maybe he was just saying that to me because, you know, he wanted to um, validate my feelings. But anyhow, he convinced me that it would be fun to set up an, an audio recorder 
in that downstairs bedroom where the, the freaky stuff had happened and to just leave it there for, for you know, overnight and then collect it the next day. So we took this like 1990s cassette tape recorder because uh, there, there, there weren't really any smartphones or things that you could record on digitally at, at that time. That was basically all we had. Uh, and we set it up in that bedroom and the next day I went back to collect it. And obviously the tape had, like it had run out. And, and that guy and I, we listened to that tape for, you know, as long as it was. Um, don't worry about that sounds. I live by a busy street. That's just trucks driving by outside. But anyhow, we, we listened to the tape and it was basically just white noise, like, and then all of a sudden, there was this like freaky ass, croaky kind of male voice saying, hello. And like he and I both just freaking just, just jumped because it was very clearly audible. Um, I wish I still had that tape. It, it would have been kind of cool to include like, and here it is, and then play it for you guys. but. I've moved so many times in my life and I've traveled so much that I've just lost things over the years and that was one of them. But yeah, so the the first ghostly place I've ever been was my grandparents' basement. And then the next ghostly place that I've been was even scarier than that. Like super frightening like you couldn't pay me a million dollars to spend a night alone in this next place I'm going to tell you about. Which you've already heard of if, if you're a regular viewer or listener of my channel. It was called the Potemkin Art Gallery and Studios in downtown Lethbridge on, on 5th Avenue South Lethbridge. Close to the Penny Coffee Shop and close to... Um, the King of Trade, which was like our local pawn shop place. Like it, it was on kind of the main downtown street, close to the art gallery, close to a, a store that I worked at called Too Hip For You. Um, apparently like Lethbridge historians say that Fifth Avenue South or Fifth Street South, it, it was right kind of close to the, the corner of Fifth Avenue and Fifth Street. It was in that vicinity. Not that you, I mean, if you know Lethbridge, this means something to you. If not, these are just useless words. Anyhow, according to Lethbridge historians, that particular part of Lethbridge is cursed by the First Nations people who were here when, when Europeans moved west and first settled Lethbridge as a, a, a coal mining town. The, the first name of, of Lethbridge was Coal Banks. And so there are coal mines that, that go like all under our city. Like the city is basically built on top of old mine shafts. And legend has it, the, the first bank of Lethbridge was built on Fifth Avenue South. And I, at the store I worked at, Too Hip For You, was actually in that building um, that had been the first bank. In fact, there's a ghost story there too that I'm gonna tell you before I get to the Potemkin art studio story. Uh, when I first got a job at Too Hip For You, my boss had taken me to the basement because she owned the whole building. There were apartments available for rent in the upstairs that they were the most gorgeous apartments I've ever seen guys like we're talking like turn of the century I think the building was built in the late 1800s so those apartments had truly antique features like beautiful beautiful antique style windows and natural hardwood floors like none of this cheap vinyl hardwood looking stuff that we have these days like it was it was nice, these apartments, like old fireplaces and it, it, anyhow, beautiful old historic building. And she took me to the basement because 
part of my job was that in the winter I had to go down there and turn on the furnace any day that it went below zero degrees and that it was like as scary looking as any old you know crazy old historic building basement could be um, there were three old bank vaults down there there were Lethbridge historical records for all the immigrants who had moved to Lethbridge between the year of like 1900 and 1920 because it had temporarily been the courthouse for the city um, crazy antique shit in that place like I wish I could go back now uh, with a big 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 group of people because I wouldn't want to go back there alone but I wish I could go back there now with a group of people to just you know, just, just snoop through all that cool old stuff. Because, like, there were court documents from, you know, really old Lethbridge times. Um, and, yeah, the furnace was kind of like if you've seen the first Home Alone movie. Kevin had, like, that, that fear of the their basement furnace because it had all these, like, weird old pipes and stuff connected to it. And it was loud. It was that kind of a furnace, but way bigger because it heated the entire building, in including the upstairs apartment suites. So when she took me down to look at this basement, I, I just asked her like, hey, do you think that this building is haunted? Because I had that same feeling, which call it intuition or call it like, being a freaking scaredy cat and just being scared of the unknown. But I, I had that same feeling down there that I used to get in my grandparents' basement. And as soon as I asked her, like, hey, do you think this building is haunted? She was like, oh, I have stories. And she pointed out this, she kind of took me deeper into the basement and pointed out this like rust colored stain on the ground. And she asked me, like, what does this look like to you? And I mean, it, it could have been like a Rorschach ink blot test, or it, it could be like me holding up this drawing I'm working on saying, like, what does this look like to you? I don't know about you guys, but I see like a phoenix rising from the flames at this point in this drawing. Unintentional, but kind of cool. Anyhow, my, my, my then boss just asked me, like, what does this stain on the ground look like to you? And I was like, it's a horse. It was shaped like like a galloping horse in motion, like with, with its mane blowing in the wind and its tail, like it was a very vivid, like it, it was as if somebody took like a rust colored paint and painted like a horse galloping on the ground. And, and she was like, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Uh, and then she told me that when she first bought that building, um, she had spoken to a, another downtown Lethbridge building owner. I think, and I could be mistaken, but I think that the person she spoke to was this really awesome witchy lady named Jose, who owns Jose's Handmade Imports, which is like, the place in Lethbridge to buy crystals and tarot cards and a lot of the stuff decorating my apartment and a lot of my clothes come from Jose's. It's just the coolest store in Lethbridge. And they, she told my boss, um, my then boss, like, you're brave to buy that building because no business has ever succeeded at that location because it's cursed and it's haunted. And that the, the only way she could kind of guarantee success at that location is if she had the place blessed by one of the spiritual elders of the local First Nations native group. Um, I wish I had written down all the details because we have there are at least three different First Nations bands in the near Lethbridge vicinity, so I don't know whether it was somebody from from the Blood Tribe or what, but anyhow, my, my then boss followed up on that and, and got the number for a local medicine woman, 
and invited her to come do a ceremony. He hired her uh, to, to basically come and bless that building. And that elder took sage and sweet grass and burned it in every single room in that building, um, including the main retail space where the store Two Hip For You was based and each of the apartments and, um, you know, the back room and also the basement. And, you know, she, she chanted these, chanted some, some ancient prayers and made the offering to, to the elders of that sweet grass and the sage. And then about a week later, she came back and she asked my then boss to take her into the basement. And she said, you know, I need to find the mark of the horse because a, an ancestor had appeared to her and told her that the building was safe and that it would be protected from then on and that she would know that it was true by finding the mark of the horse spirit in the basement. I over enunciated horse spirit so nobody thinks it's a whore's spirit because Lethbridge was pretty infamous for its red light district back in the turn of the century coal mining times too. But that's a whole other story. Um, yeah, so my then boss took this this elder downstairs and sure enough in the basement they found that thing that I just told you about that was like a, a rust stain in the perfect shape of a, of a horse, just kind of a wild horse galloping. And my then boss said she just got the chills because she had gone through that basement. Like she had done multiple walkthroughs, of course, because she bought the building and had never seen that there before. So after showing me that, she told me some of the ghost stories and like they were scary. Like I, I didn't, some of my shifts I had to work there alone and you know, horse shaped stain in the basement or not, it was truly terrifying. Um, so the, the first story that my boss told me was that when she was first preparing to open that store, she had a fairly large shipment of glassware. Um, the store basically sold a lot of this Canadian interior design company called Umbra uh, that makes these kind of Ikea looking stuff. No offense to people at Umbra if they're like, we looked nothing like Ikea, but they had a lot of those like plastic fold out chandelier type light covers and plastic, multicolored, industrial design looking modern garbage pails and stuff, like a lot of that kind of stuff. So she, she carried a lot of that kind of stuff, um, groovy girls dolls, which I thought were the ugliest things since Cabbage Patch Kids, but anyhow. Um, a lot of beads. My favorite section in that store was beads. I don't even know why I'm telling you this because that store isn't there anymore. So it's not like you could be like, oh, that sounds nice. I'm going to go buy something. I think it's a coffee shop now, sadly, because I loved that store. But anyhow, yeah, my, my boss said that she, she had an order of glassware that had come in and she and, you know, her first batch of employees, uh, and this would have been in like the late, mid to late 90s, they were unpacking some of that glassware and they heard just this sudden sound coming from within the building of just glass shattering. And she said it was so loud that they looked at all the windows first, like all the plate glass, like did somebody just smash their windows in? But there was nothing going on. Like there, there, the windows were all perfectly fine and intact and they couldn't figure out where they heard the glass shattering. Nobody had dropped anything. Um, everything looked like it was fine. And then as they unpacked more and more boxes, they found that this huge, beautiful glass vase had just imploded inside the box within all the layers of styrofoam, you know, packing foam 
and, and it, it was a box that they had all seen just sitting there. It's not like anybody had bumped it. It's not like anything happened to it. And they couldn't figure out what would have caused such an intense pressure that that vase would have literally exploded or imploded, but just burst and shattered right there inside the box. Very strange. And, you know, she said they all kind of got creeped out by it, but they just kept doing their work because what else would they do? Um, and even I had a weird kind of ghostly encounter when I was working there once. Not Surprisingly, it wasn't when I was on shift alone. It was one of the busiest days before Christmas. And I was there with a bunch of my coworkers and my then boss. And I had to go into the back room to get something like a, a customer wanted to buy something. So I was going to the back storage space to get the box that the thing she was buying came in. And there was a, a big kind of stack of empty boxes from, from shipments that we had recently received piled up in the hallway leading to that back storage closet. And as I was standing there, not even touching anything, not even doing anything, it's not even like I was breathing hard, just all of a sudden, that huge pile of boxes toppled over right next to me. And I looked at it and I, I was about to like say out loud, like, how did that happen? And before I could say, how did that happen? The entire thing of boxes just like whooshed to the side, like, like by themselves, they just, they just moved. And that was obviously like really freaking strange. I, I, to this day, I don't know how something like that could happen. Um, and yeah, and there was even a day when I was on shift when, and like, Bear in mind, I was like 18 years old at the time. I turned 18 while working at that store. So when I was first hired, I was only 17. Um, there was a day when I was on shift when my boss called me and she's like, you're gonna have to take the keys and go upstairs and check on this girl in this apartment because her family's been trying to get in touch with her. Nobody can reach her. Her phone's turned off. She didn't pay rent on the first. It's been a couple weeks. We don't know what's going on. Um, be prepared to call the police because we, we suspect maybe she might have passed away. And I was like, I was scared, guys. Like, I had to go check for a body. And I was a kid. Like, geez. Um... So I was alone on shift that day. So I, I locked up the store and put a sign on the door that said back in 15 minutes. And I like tiptoed up the stairs to the fourth floor of this building because it was a walk up, no elevator. I like gingerly tiptoed up those stairs and, and my hands were shaking and I had my cell phone in my hand, my little Nokia flip phone because it was like the year 2003. And I was, I was pretty terrified. Um, so I, I, I put the, like first I knocked on her door thinking like, please like just, just answer the door. Like let somebody answer. That would be way more comfortable. Um, I knocked on the door, nobody answered it. So my hand was shaking and I pulled out the, the keys to the building and found the key to that apartment suite. And I opened the door and it was fine. Like there was nothing thank goodness no nobody died in there there was no smell so I could tell that nobody had died in there um yeah every everything was just fine but what was weird was that there were still dirty dishes in the sink and there was still stuff on the shelves and and you know the bed was made like it didn't look like it had been abandoned it just looked like somebody had never come home one day and so I, I just locked it up again and went back down to the store and the phone was ringing when I got to the store and it was my then boss who had told her mother that she had sent me up to check on this possible dead girl and that her mom was like, dude, you can't, you can't send like an 18 year old shop girl to go look for a body like that's, that's 
like you can't like she could get traumatized for life like what the hell are you thinking like call her and tell her not to but it was too late because i had already gone up there um yeah so i told her like don't worry there's there's nothing amiss like it just looks like any other apartment um looked fine to me so the the mystery was solved a little while later like a couple weeks later my boss called me into her office and said like hey by the way like do you want to know what happened to that girl and she had become so terrified of what she said was the ghost in the building that she had checked herself into the hospital like the the psych ward because she was so panic stricken and and fearful thinking that this ghost that what she described to the doctors as like a ghost was trying to kill her in that building and i mean horse shaped medicine woman blessing or not apparently there was still a presence lurking there and when i when i asked my boss like holy crap like how does that make you feel she was like well not surprised like we've had a lot of people break their lease and move out because because of of ghostly activity and i was a little like shaken like what like like this is a regular thing like this wasn't a one-off like a lot of people have moved out because of ghosts like guys i i can tell you i've i've rented apartments in I, i've had three different apartments i rented in vancouver throughout the eight years i lived there um i had an apartment in toronto i've got an apartment right now in my hometown and i have never ever had a ghostly experience in any of these places um ever so i can't even imagine that that building was so freaking haunted that that multiple tenants broke their leases and moved out or, or that a girl would even check herself in for for psychiatric help because she was so terrified of this ghost so that brings us to the potemkin artist artist studios and gallery where I would say the, the most frightening ghostly experience I have ever had took place. Um, the first ghost experience I had in the Potemkin, I was hanging out in my friend Russ's apartment, not apartment, studio. Shoot, and I'm so sorry, I wasn't gonna name any specific names. I've done so good up until this point, but I let my guard down and I accidentally named a person. And I, I didn't ask, I, I wasn't able to contact any of my little cousins yet to say, hey, can I tell your story? That's why I didn't name any of them or my, my old boss. So anyhow, I think he'd be cool with this. I, it, it's nothing that would be in any way like bad, his involvement in the story. Um, anyhow, I, I, through some mutual friends, I was invited up to this guy's studio and he was a really cool local DJ like um, all the local MCs would always get him to spin records for them so they could they could um, rap and he he just had this awesome studio where he did a bunch of graffiti style art and he had his turntables set up and they threw some wicked parties there that you know, a year later when I rented a studio myself with my then boyfriend, uh, we we would kind of co-host those parties and just keep both of our doors open and people would, you know, move from one studio to the next. It was pretty cool. But the first time I ever went up to his studio and was partying there, um, I asked, you know, to use the restroom. And somebody told me, like, walk to the end of the hall, turn right, like there's an L shape in the building, go past the central room that was always locked up. It was like a storage space, like go past there, you'll pass a little kitchenette and then there's another small little hallway um, 
with no lights, like small, dark, dingy, little tiny hallway in this building. Uh, the bathroom is at the end of that little hallway. And it's not really a bathroom, it's just a toilet in a, in a closet. Um, you, you, you can use that and then there's a sink where you can wash your hands in another room and then they described where that room was. Like guys, this, this old historic building, it was not even zoned for living. That's why it was rented out cheap for art studios. So I I really thought nothing of it. Like I, I wasn't scared. Like I, I had no reason to be afraid. I just, you know, made my way feeling the walls through the dark to this bathroom and found it. And of course there was a light in the bathroom it, it was just the hall leading to it that was dark. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I got to the bathroom. I'm at, it was number one. <laughs> Not that it's any of your business, you sicko. But yeah, I, I, I sat down on the toilet. I would never tell this kind of a bathroom story except that it's pertinent to the theme of ghost stories. But yeah, I, I sat down on the bathroom and on the toilet. And suddenly I just had this weird, creeped out feeling that, oh my god, like, it feels like I'm being watched. And so I looked at the door, which was right next to me, because it was a small little space, and the door didn't have a window or anything, like, it, it was a solid door. It didn't even have, like, a keyhole that somebody could peek through, so I was like, why do I feel like I'm being watched? Like, this is the strangest thing. And finally I looked up and I got so mad because there was a freaking skylight above the toilet that it, it wasn't even a skylight to the stars. It was a skylight to the attic. And I was like, why the f would there be a skylight? Not even to the sky like this. And there was a man peeping Tom and me, like, like watching me pee through this, through this attic skylight. And, and like I said, I wasn't scared. I was mad. I started yelling at him like, F off. Only I said the word that rhymes with duck, like duck with an F off, like get out of here. What the hell are you doing? And he just laughed and he had this like sinister look on his face and he was wearing a top hat and and a suit and tie like he looked like a 1950s businessman and i was wondering like why is this weird pervert like dressed up in old time clothes watching me through a skylight like this is weird it was weird and like i, I was just kind of sitting there for a couple of minutes because i didn't want to stand up so he could see my lower half bare like I didn't want to wipe I didn't want to get up until he left but he wouldn't leave and that was the creepiest thing about it like I I haven't had many peeping Tom experiences in my life the only ones I've had have been ghosts um but I I kind of thought like when you're caught don't you run away like if i was a sick pervert watching a girl on the toilet and she caught me i'd leave but no he didn't leave he just kept kept lurking there like staring down through that through that skylight window thing and so finally i had to just wipe up and flush and and go to another room through another dark lit closet the, the same dark lit hallway but find the other water closet where I could wash my hands um and I was yelling the whole time like effing asshole like I can't believe you're, you're like what kind of a pervert like blah 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 and I I like I was I was a little drunk to be honest that's why I was yelling and so mad because normally I'm fairly demure and calm but I was an 18 year old drunk girl who just got creeped out on the toilet so you can imagine how mad I was and I went back to my friend's studio and there was a fairly large group of guys there I was the only girl I think maybe my my other female friend was there I can't really remember but I I remember I walked into that group of guys thinking like I'm gonna rally the troops and they are gonna kick this creepy hatted men's ass like like this is not acceptable 
so I went into that studio and I was like livid and I was like I, I, I just kind of motioned for my friend like to please just turn the volume down and I was like you won't believe what just happened to me in the bathroom and like one of the guys went white and and like every there was like a hush in that studio and my friend who who was the one throwing that party like in fact I, I had just met him this was the first time I ever met this guy he he just kind of stopped spinning and said oh shit like I didn't I didn't tell you because I didn't think it was gonna happen but there's a there's like there's a peeping Tom ghost like did you see it and I was like ghost and I was like, dude, I don't think that was a ghost. Like, it was a physical man. And he was like, well, was he wearing a suit and tie and like a, a gentleman's hat? Like the kind of hat a man would wear out on the town in like, in like the 1950s? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, no, Sarah, like that's the ghost. That, that's, not, that's not an actual peeping Tom, like it's a ghost. And then he told me about a bunch of other girls who similarly had gone to use that bathroom and and had that peeping Tom ghost watch them through through that same skylight. And that's when my my anger became fear, because I was like, holy shit, like that's why it had that sinister look on its face. And that's why he didn't leave when I caught him. Like, holy moly, like that was a ghost. And yeah, and, and then my friend with his studio there was saying, like, you should talk to this other guy who, who rented a studio down the hall who had had a friend of his stay there once when she was between apartments. Um, and I was like, why? Like, what happened to her? And he's like, oh, she, she was a good friend of all of theirs, this other girl. Uh, he said she won't even go to parties in that studio building anymore because it was so traumatic what happened to her and he said that like he he told me the story as he could best recall it and it, it was a friend of this pro skateboarder guy who rented a studio there and and that guy's studio was usually empty because he was typically out of town touring and apparently like he gave a, a friend of his the key to his studio because he knew that her lease was up and she was going to move into a new apartment, but there were like a couple of weeks in between when she was moving and when the next place would be available. So anyhow, she had set up a tent within his studio and kind of, it, it sounded pretty cool to me actually, to be honest. She set up a tent inside the studio and a sleeping bag inside that tent and was basically like camping out in in his, in her friend's art studio. Um, and the first night that she slept there, after setting it all up, she woke up in the middle of the night to a heavy pressure on her chest, like somebody was sitting on her chest. And because she was in a tent, in a studio at night with all the lights off, it was pitch black, so she couldn't see anything. She just felt something sitting on her chest and then she felt these like, these clammy cold hands just wrap themselves around her, her, her neck and start choking her. And she had to physically fight to get this, this what she thought was a man. Like she didn't immediately first think ghost. She thought there's a man and he's probably trying to strangle her and rape her like she thought somebody had physically broken into the building. Uh, so she fought it the way you would fight uh, an intruder. And it fought back. And and then she felt the, the covers, like the sleeping bag she was in, start unrolling, like rolling itself down off her body. And like she grabbed her keys and like pushed the thing away and turned on the light on her way out and there was nobody there as you might imagine because this isn't called like scary break-in rapist stories it's called ghost stories like 
when she flicked on the light she she saw in her mad dash down the stairs to the front door of the building she saw that the room was empty and, and that for some reason was even scarier than if there had been a buddy there with a knife or something like she she got attacked in the night by a ghost and it was from what I recall, this incident happened to her in the winter time, so it would have been cold out and she had to run like in her pajamas to her van. Thank God she at least had a van. And yeah, she slept in her van for the rest of that period between apartments because there was no way she was gonna sleep in that studio. Um, and she got friends to come with her to get her sleeping bag and, and her and her tent and everything out because she didn't want to go in by herself. Rightly so, like who would after having that kind of a trauma experience. So yeah, my, my dumbass teenage self was so eager for independence that, you know, less than a year later or about a year later, when I had a studio there that I rented with my then boyfriend, um, I, we would sleep there some nights because we were so young that, that we didn't have our own places. So I still lived with my mom. He still lived with his parents. It was kind of like having our, our first grown up place of our own. We had that studio. Um, yeah. So, so one night we were going to sleep there. The, the first I don't think it was the first time we slept there because we had crashed there uh, on nights when we had had wild parties, but it was much less scary when we crashed there after a party because there, there would have been like a good 18 to 20 other people also crashing there. Like imagine like five or six people still awake, listening to music in another room and a few people in the hall talking and you slowly drift off to sleep, you know, in your studio. Like, it, it's not really scary because you're not really alone. Like, there are still people up and about and awake and you're just like, it's 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. and the party's ending and you're just passing out. Um, so yeah, we, we had slept there on other occasions, but the first night we ever slept there totally alone by ourselves, nobody else was in the building just just we were all alone he got up in the night to go use the bathroom and like I said like our studio much like our DJ friends studio our studio didn't have a bathroom so he had to walk down that long dark hallway to get to the bathroom and there were sunlights of course in the building so he turned on all the lights on his way. He didn't even wake me up to say like, hey, Sarah, I'm going to the bathroom. I was asleep at that point. He just got up to use the bathroom. And what woke me up was the sound of all the studio doors in the building slamming shut, like thunk, 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 like, like it terrified me. I woke up so scared because first and foremost, I heard the door to our bedroom slam shut, and then I heard the door to our studio slam shut, and then it was like the, the slamming doors moved down the hall, and I could hear like the far distant door slam shut, and then the next door, then the next door, then the next door, and it was like this rush of slamming doors. And then I heard my big, brave, then boyfriend scream from the bathroom which was like five or six apartment sized studios away. He screamed my name like, Sarah, why did you turn off all the lights? And my heart started to race because I was in bed in our studio and I had not touched any lights. So I shouted back, I'm still in bed. And then I could hear his, his tone turn. Like at first it sounded like he was just mad and he's like, then who just slammed all the doors? And I was like, I thought you did that. Cause I, I, I straight up at first thought maybe he was trying to prank me or scare me. Cause we, we were pranksters a bit, but no, he was terrified. And he's like, come meet me here. Like I, I can't walk back to the studio by myself. It's dark. And I was like, no way, dude. Like 
I'm not getting up out of this bed. Like, I was terrified. He was terrified. Um, and the lights had all gone out. That was the strangest thing about all of this, was that he had turned on all the hallway lights to get to the bathroom. And they just all went out. And the, the light switch was close to our studio. It was not close to the bathroom. So he had a, a much farther walk in the dark than I would have had. So the the bedroom that we were in um, had a window that, that faced the street. So I opened the curtains and let in some of the street light. And in the dimness of that street light, I fumbled my way to the hallway light switch and turned the lights back on. And then I walked to the bathroom to meet him in the light. And he and I together tried every studio door to see like what's up like is somebody else in the building but every other studio was locked and and so we don't know to this day i have no idea how that happened and it, it's not like it was just me like it it happened to both of us we both heard all of those doors slam shut and he was truly terrified and I was truly terrified and it was it was creepy it I I would I'm gonna end the video with that story because that was the scariest ghost experience I've ever had because there, there were so many elements to it that were physical the lights going out the sound of all of those doors slamming shut um I think the experience our, our skate, skate, skater friend's friend had had, that was even scarier, but it's not technically my story. I'm just retelling her story. I think that would have been way, way scarier because she was alone when it happened. But, but for my experiences, that was the scariest one because, you know, all of those doors were locked. So we don't know how they could have been slammed shut. Um, the lights, we don't know how the lights got turned off. And yeah, actually, no, there was one other incident that happened in that building that was terrifyingly strange. Um, back in that day, like for whatever reason, I was in my studio without a cell phone one night. Maybe my cell phone had died or maybe I had left it at work or at home by mistake, but for some reason I was there and I didn't have my phone. And I, I, I didn't know what time it was, and I checked my watch. I still wore a watch in those days. And it was, my watch said it was six o'clock, but it couldn't have been six o'clock because I had closed up to it for you, the store where I worked, at six o'clock and walked to the studio. So I was like, wait a minute, it's gotta be at least seven. So I walked down to like the, the kitchenette area where there was like a microwave, a toaster, a, a tea kettle and a coffee pot. Like it, it wasn't a full kitchen. It was kind of like a, like a dorm kitchen that all of us who rented studios shared. And yeah, and so I walked to that kitchenette and there was a group of people standing there having some drinks. And I was like, hey, do any of you know what time it is? And one of the girls who was there just like looked up really slowly and she's like, no, why do you ask? And I was like, that's kind of a weird thing to say. Like I, I ask because I don't know what time it is. And she's like, you're wearing a watch, right? And I was like, yeah, but my watch stopped at six o'clock. And then she like dropped her glass. She's like, holy shit, my watch stopped at six o'clock. And then one of the guys pointed to the clock that was up in the hall and it was stopped at six o'clock. So all of our, all of our time telling devices had all stopped at six and there were three of us there. And like, I'm not a religious person, but when something that strange happens and it equals out to the number 666, it is effing creepy, whether you believe in biblical nonsense or not. Um, somebody had commented on my Facebook post when I said I'd do a video telling ghost stories that ghosts aren't really scary. It's just kind of funny to see how these things try to get our attention. And like, yeah, 
good joke, like they got us, but at the time it was not funny. It was very, very scary. Um, and the other thing is from, from that time on, I, from the first time I saw the peeping Tom ghost in the skylight, I never went to the bathroom by myself in that building ever again. I would either bring my then boyfriend with me or if he wasn't there, I would get somebody else to come with me, but to just stand right outside of the door. Um, Cause I was a scaredy cat and I think rightfully so. And I think anybody would have been scared to be in that building. Um, I don't remember the address of the Potemkin studio, but like I said, the building is empty now, but it is still there. It's, it's still standing in downtown Lethbridge. Um, one of my aunties has a friend, uh, I think her name is Belinda, uh, who used to work at the Galt Museum, which is like the, the main museum in Lethbridge. And this lady gives an annual walking tour like the creepy Lethbridge or haunted Lethbridge walking tour once a year. And apparently this building is one of the stops on that walking tour. They do like a walking tour of all the haunted places in downtown Lethbridge. And I, I keep meaning to go on that walking tour one year so that when it reaches that point, I can say, hey, by the way, this and this and this happened here. And I think it would be interesting to find out who that, who that, 1950s had a ghost man peeping tom creep was because apparently that was also kind of the red light district back in back in the day and my awareness of costumes throughout history is not that great so what i interpreted as being like a 1950s bowler hat or top hat it wasn't a fancy top hat like i've I call all men's hats top hats if they're not like berets or baseball caps. Like it, it was just a, a brimmed hat. Um, it could very well have been from the 1800s or the 1900s, like when those buildings were new. I don't know. Um, but it would be very curious, very interesting to find out who that dude was. Because, you know, he was probably a creep in life because he's such a creep in in death if it's a ghost if not i mean i i i don't even like to talk about these kinds of things as if they're legit real because i know it sounds crazy and i know 90 percent of people either don't believe in this stuff or at least they say they don't believe in this stuff but i'm telling you i dare you to spend a night in that building by yourself if you don't believe in this I mean, you wouldn't have listened to an hour and 17 minutes of me talking about ghosts if you don't believe in them, I would think. Unless you really love watching me draw or, or hearing my voice, but I think if you've listened this far, you're probably not a total complete skeptic. But if you are a total complete skeptic, the dare is extended. Like, I dare you to go to Progress Clothing, because I think the owners of Progress Clothes in Lethbridge still own that that building I dare you to go and just ask them to spend a night in the building that used to be the Potemkin studio and just have fun there use the bathroom uh, sleep in one of the studios keep the lights off see what happens because every single night that I spend in that building something happened so I'm gonna leave it at that this drawing turned out way different from most of my drawings Partly because when I when I paused at the part waypoint and saw what kind of looked like a like a crazy mythical sort of a bird or like a like a phoenix, I didn't really want to surround that in drawn details and lose it. So I kind of wanted to leave it untouched. I've done other stuff around it. I may add more to this off camera. I may not but a, a free downloadable print will be in my Patreon page for all of my patrons, thanks to whom videos like this are made possible. And if you want to get in on that Patreon club, uh, there, there are no tiers. You, you give what you can, you know. I, I have somebody in, in my Patreon group who pays $1 a month, and that is highly appreciated. It, it goes towards my internet bill, my cell phone bill, the tripod as shaky as it might be. I'm sorry about that, but I, I balance it on the couch because I sit on the couch and draw. Um, 
I'm gonna tape the phone off the tripod and just show you. Like I've, I'm drawing on my lap. My kitty Oreo is sitting over there listening. But yeah, my, my Patreon page makes these videos possible. And as a thank you to my generous patrons, I do a monthly Zoom call that includes a Q&A session. They can ask me about anything that they want and I answer. Usually it's about my cult experience in India with the fraud who calls himself Nityananda. Um, sometimes we do art show and tells and yeah, it, it's just a fun monthly Zoom meeting. So if you want in on that, it's exclusively for my patrons. And I also give them prints of my drawings that they can print out and keep and some exclusive content. I've made a few videos um, that are just for them because it, it's a little more personal and I'm, I'm not ready to just share it with every single person on the internet. I'm only ready to share it with every person on the internet who pays for it. So if you want to see what that exclusive content is, I'll put a link to my Patreon in the video description and I'll put a link to my Etsy shop where I make, where I sell the jewelry I make, including this, this Larimar and Iolite bracelet that I wore in this video that was probably mostly off camera. But yeah, thank you to those who, who contribute in that way. If you enjoyed this, please give a like and a comment. And if you want to hear more ghost stories, because guys, this, this was just a few of them. Uh, let me know in the comments if you want to hear more. And maybe on Halloween or sometime during Inktober, I'll, I'll draw another, I'll do another scary story, ghost story video. Otherwise, let me know in the comments what you would like to hear about, if there's any kind of art style you'd like to see me try. I'm up to the challenge. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell because uh, that way you'll see when I make new content. Much love. Thanks for listening. All the best. Sleep tight. Bye.